Good morning, everybody. What a joy to be in worship with you again today. Spring has sprung, but we know better, right? <laughs> There's still a few days of winter yet to come, but we welcome you. And if you're a guest today, we're delighted that you're with us. Please help yourself to one of the Congregational Church mugs. In it, you'll find all manner of information about our church, our beliefs, and our passions to, uh, to care for those in need within our community and world. A special word of greeting to our KXRA radio listeners today, and a big thank you to those who continue to sponsor that radio ministry. Um, there may be uh, 50, 60 of us gathered in worship but we know with the KXRA broadcast, we're reaching hundreds in our surrounding community. And uh, we welcome you. We're glad that you're here at First Congregational Church where people believe, belong, and become. Moving right along with our announcements this morning, this Wednesday we have yet another in our series on of God's household, understanding the refugee crisis. And uh, this past week uh, was amazing. We got very personal. We began to look at our own assumptions and understandings about refugees and the immigration process, and the conversation was lively. And I think we had the most folks gathered this week, about 40 of us. And uh, for this coming week, I hope we can even double that amount. And this, this is an invitation I extend to you and also the... Our presenter this coming Wednesday at 6 p.m. will be Kathy Langer, who is uh, from the Catholic Charities uh, Diocese of St. Cloud. And uh, she'll be talking, of course, about the refugee crisis, but she will also be bringing four guests with her, Somalians who uh, have now made their homes here in the United States, who will have first-person uh, descriptions and experiences to share with us there will also be a time to ask questions. Uh, come and uh, learn firsthand of what it must be like to be a refugee, uh, having to leave your family, your culture, your friends, everything familiar, and coming to an unfamiliar place. I want to thank um, uh, all the members uh, of our church, and especially Daisy Stahlberg, for helping to, to create our series this year, and I hope you'll be there. This Wednesday, 5.30 for the meal, 6 to 7 for program at First Congregational Church. Thank you, angels. Each month we have a new set of angels. This, this month, Seal Campbell and Celeste Podolsky, who are responsible for visiting and delivering blankets, care blankets, to those who have been hospitalized or who have recently experienced a loss. In March, uh, we have two angels uh, who are trained and ready to serve. If any of you have an interest in that program, talk to me after church. We'd love to recruit some new folks to be part of that caregiving outreach to uh, family and friends. And then uh, finally, uh, just a little bit of horn tooting must go on today. If you didn't already hear, uh, the dart baseball team from First Congregational Church, our own guys, took first prize this year. We are the grand champions. Thank you, thank you. Our team won uh, six of their seven games, and uh, I'll tell you, there was no one more surprised than us. So <laughs> it is the first time in a long time, I think ever, that I know that our team took first place. The trophy on the screen is also... Uh, available in the coffee room downstairs along with the big number one balloon floating above it. Uh, yeah, you got to be proud of these guys. They worked hard. And uh, we've, we, uh, in addition to those pictured, we also want to mention that, um, that, we, that we have Roger uh, Hoxsprung, who was unable to be here, but he has helped uh, motivate us and push us to victory through the many practices through the season. So his name is also on that plaque. So very good. Let's, uh, let's take a moment this morning, and I'll invite you all to rise and greet one another. Let, let us know how good it is to be in worship here at First Congregational United Church of Christ, where people believe, belong, and become. Yeah, I'm done. 
Please uh, continue standing as we continue. Anderson to come forward to share one brief announcement, and then he will lead us uh, following my prayer of invocation in the responsive call to worship. So let's begin with a prayer, shall we? Holy God, you've greeted us as you always do with open arms and hugs and kisses beyond our belief. You are a God who not only created us, but like a parent, welcomes us back day after day. And for our communion with you and our relationship with you, we are truly blessed. So we have come this day to worship you, and we do so with eyes upraised and with hearts extended to you in love, open to hear where you might direct us today in our service in your name. Amen. I have one quick announcement that we have opportunities for those who would care to join the worship committee. Uh, as in the prodigal son, either you can return and serve again, or remember, as, as for the, one, the son that stayed there, God is always with us, and I feel like I'm preaching to the choir because <laughs> you all are here every Sunday, and, uh, but we do have opportunities for those to join us in the worship committee. Excellent. And they Thank you. If you would be so kind to join me in the responsive call to worship. A new day is dawning. It is God's gift to us to enjoy. We are a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old has passed away. The new has come. This is a day for forgiveness and reconciliation. Celebrate God's love for the lost ones who are found. The glad cries of deliverance surround us. Shouts of joy arise from our hearts. Let all who are faithful after, I'm sorry, offer up prayers. May all who are in Christ give thanks. We'll be glad for the wideness of God's mercy. With the upright of heart, we will rejoice and sing. today we are actually using our hymnal page 642 the black one which is past the hymns onto that page which will also be found on the screen and we are joining with the choir in singing the response I will have uh, Margaret play the response once first we will have the choir sing the response and then in unison we will do the response and then I will continue with the actual psalm Steadfast love surrounds those who trust in God. Surrounds those who trust in God. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. 
Happy are those to whom God imputes no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. While I kept silence, my body wasted away through my grooming all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the, late, the last of summer. Steadfast love surrounds those who trust in God. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to God, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer. Of distress, the rush of mighty waters shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with glad cries of deliverance. Steadfast love surrounds those who trust in God. I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding, whose temper must be curbed with bit and bridle, else it will not stay near you. Many are the torments of the wicked, and steadfast love surrounds those who trust in God. Be glad to God and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Oh, uh -huh.
So if you were wondering at any point in your time here as members of First Congregational Church whether you had the right stuff and the stamina to stand and sing with a choir, we've just proven you wrong. <laughs> you did right well with all of those back-to-back -back musical pieces. And uh, I'll just remind you, the choir is always looking for new recruits. So we're getting ready for Easter, and it would be delicious. Margaret or myself after worship, and we'll uh, give you all the details. We've been looking, as I said earlier in our service today, at the crisis of the refugee influx of folks into our communities and, and countries all around the world. I thought it would be uh, helpful if we just took a minute this morning to look at some of the founding principles of the many faith families that are represented in those groups. Did you know that central to the Hindu faith is the Dharma, a law and a set of values about compassion and nonviolence towards all, and a willingness to serve the stranger as the unknown guest among you? Providing food and shelter to the needy stranger was a traditional duty of the householder and was practiced today still. The Tipika is a Buddhist uh, scripture which describes and highlights the importance of cultivating the four states of mind. There are many different traditions within the Buddhist faith, but the concept of karuna is a fundamental tenet in every one of them. It embodies the qualities of tolerance and non-discrimination, inclusion and empathy for the suffering of others, mirroring the central role which compassion plays in other religions. And in the Jewish faith, in the sacred Torah, the Old Testament scripture in our, uh, in our, UC, in our uh, Christian faith, there are 36 references to honoring the stranger. In the book of Leviticus, we read one of the most prominent tenets of the Jewish faith, quote, the stranger who resides with you shall be to you as one of your citizens. You shall love him or her as yourself, for you were once strangers in the land of Egypt. And if any of us looks back even a generation or two, we discover that we are all immigrants, that we are all refugees at some point coming to these great United States. In the Christian faith, we, we understand there are 92 separate uh, biblical mandates to care for the ones in need, uh, one that you will know well from Matthew 32, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. And finally, even in the Holy Quran, in the Muslim faith, it calls for the protection of the asylum seeker, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, whose safety is irreparable. Of Amman, the provision for security and protection. Those who give asylum and aid are in very truth the believers. For them is the forgiveness of sins and the provision most generous. Now you may wonder in your own mind, how does this wash with all of the rhetoric we see on TV and in the newspaper? Well, the folks uh, from the Muslim faith that get all of the news coverage and all of the hype are the ones that are radically, extremely fundamentalistic in their faith. They do not represent the Muslims in general. Rather, this does. Today, um, before we, we step into our time of prayer, I would, I would say that my prayer is actually going to be a, um, an adaptation of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees um, statement about refugees and welcoming the stranger. But before that, I want to call to your attention the needs of several of our members and friends. First of all, um, Joy, uh, one of our, our, our uh, friends of the church who has been attending regularly, her father-in-law has had a lung biopsy and uh, we're praying for the very best outcome, uh, the results of which we hope will be shared this coming Monday. So let's pray for John Beal, Joy's father-in-law, and a good outcome for his um, his cancer scare. He lives in uh, Shawnee uh, Mission, Kansas City. Um, I don't know if you knew, but Merle Higley has been uh, recently 
placed in the hospice care. I saw Merle this last Thursday, and he was having a really good day. Um, he recognized me. His niece was visiting from Iowa City, and um, he was feeling so good, in fact, he had his art supplies out, and he was going to do a little painting Thursday afternoon. I'll look forward to seeing what he created uh, at my next visit. I've had several conversations with Mike Doxey, and he continues to be doing better and better, strengthening that good leg of his, hopefully, he says, being back in church before Easter. And I would love to look back and see Mike with us again. So we pray for those in our hearts and minds, family members and friends, uh, in need of care and rejuvenation and healing this day. At this time, I invite you to join with me in a brief silent prayer, and then I will share uh, what I had shared earlier, this uh, comment, this, this uh, prayer, if you will, from the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Let us pray silently. God, the core value of our faith is to welcome the stranger, the refugee, the internally displaced, the other. We shall seek to treat him or her as we would wish to be treated, and we will seek to challenge others, even leaders in our own faith community, to do the same. Together today we pray, O oh God, for faith leaders faith-based organizations across the denominational scope, as well as those others who embody the tenets of love and acceptance among all of the world religions. We together will seek to welcome the stranger. Our faith teaches that compassion and mercy and love and hospitality are for everyone and not just a few, the native born, and the foreign-born, the members of our community, and the newcomers. We will remember and remind members of our own community that we are considered strangers somewhere, that we should treat the stranger to our community as we ourselves would like to be treated, and to challenge intolerance and indifference when we see it. We will remember, O oh God, and remind others in our communities that no one leaves this. Some flee because of persecution. Some are refugees because of violence or exploitation. Others due to natural disaster. Yet others out of love who provide better lives for their families. So we recognize this day, O oh God, all, poor, all persons are entitled to dignity and respect as human beings, as your love creation. All those in our country, including the strangers, are subject to its laws, and none should be subject to hostility or discrimination. And so, Lord, we will offer as best as we are able by your grace, hospitality to the stranger. For this brings us blessings not only upon our community, but upon our families, upon the stranger, and upon us. We will respect and honor the reality that the stranger may be a different faith or hold beliefs different than my own or the members of our community. And we will respect their right to practice their own faith freely. We will seek to create space where they can freely worship and to find you as their culture and religion dictate. We will speak our own faith without demeaning or ridiculing the faith of others. We will build bridges between strangers and ourselves. Through our examples, we will encourage others to do the same. We will make an effort not only to welcome, but also to listen deeply and to promote understanding and welcome in our community of our justice, and we will do so for all people. We will not keep silent 
when we see others, even leaders in our faith community, speaking ill of strangers, judging them without coming to know them, and when we see them being excluded or wronged or oppressed, we will encourage our faith communities to work with other faith communities and faith-based organizations to find better ways to assist them. Yes, O oh God, help us to welcome the stranger and in so doing, remind us of the tenets of our own faith that when we have done so to the least of these, we have done so also to your loved Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And now hear us, O oh God, as we unite in one voice proclaiming the truth of who and whose we are. The prayer which Jesus taught us, saying in one voice, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. kindergarten teacher was walking around observing her classroom of children one day during art time they were drawing pictures she came to one little girl who was working very diligently and asked her what she was drawing the little girl replied without looking up I'm drawing a picture of God the teacher paused and said but no one knows what God looks like without missing a beat the little girl replied they will in a minute. <laughs> so I want to ask this morning before the scripture reading, what is think the most important question in life is, do you believe in God or not? But perhaps the more important question is, who is the God that you believe in? And it's such an important question because it defines what your relationship God will look like passive or active, involved or on the sidelines. 
There are many different religions in the world that present many different pictures of God. You could say that each one of those gives us a unique glimpse of God as they have come to know God through their culture, their experience, their upbringing, just as we have come to our understandings of God in the Western culture. So what is God really like? Is God the God of the extremists, the fundamentalist terrorists, who rains down death and destruction on everyone who he perceives to be outside the faith? Or is God the impersonal God of the deist? Deism teaches God created a world like a watchmaker creates a beautiful watch who winds it up and then steps back impassionately behind the scenes to observe how it will all end up. We learned at our midweek Lenten conversation this past Wednesday that Hinduism has some core beliefs very similar to our own. It teaches that there are a number of gods and goddesses, but the greatest god is the creator uh, Brahman, the all-pervasive life essence in every living being. And then there are the New Agers, Christians who similarly believe that God is the positive life force in every entity. So what is God like for you? Is God an impersonal watchmaker far off in the cosmos? Is God the ruthless God of the terrorists? Or is God maybe the good side of the force, like those Star Wars movies? Christians generally believe that through the life and teachings of Jesus, we learn what is most important to know about God. Jesus shares a particularly interesting parable story today, one that is very familiar to all of us, in which he gives several beautiful insights into the character and the nature and personality of God. Let's look at the story of the prodigal son or lost son, or what is sometimes also called the parable of the loving father. In the Gospel of Luke chapter 15, Verses 11 through 32, we read these words. Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of your estate. So the father divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country. And there he squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went, and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's own hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will send, set out and go back to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, maybe like one of your hired servants. So the young man got up, and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, and he was filled with such compassion for him. And he ran to his son, and he threw his arms around him, and he hugged him, and he kissed him. The son said to his father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick! Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandal on his feet. Bring that fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and let's celebrate. For this son of mine who is dead is alive again. He was lost and he is found. So they began to celebrate. Well, meanwhile, the older son was in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard the music and all the hoopla, the dancing and such. So he called one of the servants and he asked him what was going on. The servant told him, your brother has come. Your father has killed the fatted calf because of him being back safe and sound. The older brother became very angry and he refused to go in. So his father went out and he pleaded with his son. 
But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed any of your orders, yet you have never given me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and now he is found. Here ends the reading of the Holy Scripture. May God add a blessing to the hearing, understanding, and living of the Word this day. Well, as I said earlier, this is a pretty familiar biblical story to those of us who have been raised in the Christian church. It's one that I'm sure Pam has shared with her youngins many, many times over the years. Ones that we heard at the knees of our parents and grandparents about the younger son who demanded to receive his inheritance. Talk about uh, a radical departure from tradition. According to Jewish law, a father who had two sons was to leave two-thirds of his estate to the older son and the remaining one-third to the younger son. The younger son came to his dad and he said, in essence, I know you're going to die someday, but I don't want to wait that long for my inheritance, so give me all of that stuff now. We can imagine that dad was wounded to the heart by such a harsh demand, but because he loved his son so much and so dearly, he granted the request. He probably had to take some time to sell off his land or livestock to liquidate some of his assets, but eventually he did come up with that one-third of his worth, and he hands it over to his younger son with best wishes. Well, we all know what happens next. Immediately, the son takes the money and runs. He walks out of his father and his family, and he heads for a country far away. We can well imagine that there were many tears shed night and day, by that loving father over his son's recklessness and foolish behavior. Clearly, Jesus means for us to see that the father in this parable represents God. There's the face of God. He is a loving parent who will even let us walk away from fellowship with him if we so desire and choose, but it breaks his fatherly heart when we do so. The message I believe Jesus is sharing today is this. God loves you so much that he will never force you to stay in fellowship with him. He doesn't coerce obedience and loyalty from you. And to serve him. That's a good message for all us parents. In fact, God loves you so much he allows you to make your own choices. Even when those choices bring you and your loved ones grief and harm. Some of you here this morning know exactly how that father felt in today's text, don't you? You are the parents or perhaps the grandparents of prodigals. Those of you who have prodigal children or grandchildren in your family know exactly the kind of pain at the heart that the father was feeling today. You know what it's like to have a grown child who you have been, become alienated from, and it really hurts. When they were little, you could discipline them, but now you only feel frustration and pain at the broken relationship and the poor decisions you see being made day after day. I just want you to know today that you're not alone. God knows you're hurt. Why do I say that? Because God is hurting right along with you, maybe even more. Why do I say that? Because the greater the capacity to love, the greater the capacity to feel hurt. And God's love is stronger than any human love we can imagine. We fall short as parents. God's love is constant and sure. There's a second insight into the nature of God and that we love and worship. Remember in that story how the younger son had lost everything and finally, as Jesus said, came to his senses? He realized a servant in his father's house had it way better than he was having it. So he swallowed his pride and he started the long, humbling journey back home again. 
I discovered something this week that I had never known before in 30-some years of ministry, something that sheds even more light on the extreme generosity and love of God, the Father, in this parable. Biblical scholars had actually discovered a similar story to that of the prodigal son that Jesus told. It was a story ages older than Jesus, told among the Jewish rabbis many, many years before the story told today. In the earlier form, the younger son ran away and he spent all of his father's money. And when he came crawling back home, the father did not receive him, but in fact rejected him. So as Jesus was telling the story today of the lost son and the loving father, the Pharisees and the tax collectors and everyone within earshot was thinking, yeah, 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 I've heard this story before. I know how it ends. What his audience believed was that this parable was going to end something like this, where one day the father saw his son returning. He waited with his arms crossed across his chest, and the broken-down son begged his father to take him back, but the father looked him square in the eye, and he said, Forget it. You had your chance. You messed up. You chose to live like a pig, and now you go back to be with the pigs. You made your bed. Now you go sleep in it. Any of your parents ever say that to you? That just came back to me now. So yeah, in the well-known original story, the father turned his son away and told him he was getting exactly what he deserved. It was a very old story that reflected an Old Testament value of strict history. It probably was a story that was instructive and essential for the survival of the tribe tribe in the wilderness. You couldn't stand disobedience because it threatened the existence of the tribe, but the story changed in Jesus' telling. In fact, the Old Testament Bible actually prescribes that a father who had a disobedient son or rebellious son could stone him to death. In Deuteronomy 21, 18 through 21, look it up. For some of you with stubborn, rebellious teenage sons, you might think, hey, that's not a bad verse. But the point is, this was the way the Pharisees expected the father in the story to treat his son today. That was the normal ending of the story. But Jesus gives us this surprise twist in the plot in verse 20. A long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him, and he ran to his son with arms open. Picture with me the father in Jesus' parable. His heart was broken when his son had left. Every day while he was gone, the father thought of his son and wondered, as each and every one of us must do when our children grow astray, how were things going for him? Each afternoon about sundown, we could see him walking to the edge of his property and standing at the stone fence and looking down that road that had taken his son away. He was looking and longing and hoping that one day his son would return. And then one afternoon, he sees a bent-over figure dragging down along the road. And in a flash, his father realizes that it has Then he did this amazing thing. He he jumps over the stone wall and he sprints out to meet his son. In the Jewish culture, men wore these long robes and in order to run, a man had to lift the hem of his his robe and, and keep it high in order to keep from tripping. In doing so, he would have bared his legs, which was considered highly undignified. Men of respect never ran. It would have been too embarrassing. But embarrassment aside, the love of the father prevails. He can't, can't you just see the father grabbing handfuls of robe and running down towards his son? He didn't wait for his son to reach him. He ran to meet his son. Then the Bible says, quote, the father was filled with compassion and he ran and he threw his arms around his son and he kissed him. The Greek word there indicates he kept on. Mothered, he showered his loved son in kisses. Do you get the picture? Jesus wants us to see that God is not only the creator of the universe, but importantly, 
the loving parent who welcomes each and every one of us home again when we have strayed in the same way as the prodigal. God welcomes you just as you are, without judgment, without punishment, without condemnation. To the parents or the grandparents of prodigals, I would say, number one, God understands your pain. Sometimes you want to sing that old song, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. But that's not really true when it comes to God. God knows and God cares. He is the suffering father in this parable. Number two, resist the desire to jump in the pig pen to rescue the prodigal. In this parable, the father didn't go to the pig pen. He didn't go out seeking his son on the highways and byways of life in that other country so far away to pull his son out of danger. That would have been tragic. The son had to realize his own mistake. God used the pig pen, if you will, the adversity of life to bring him to the realization. Don't go to the pig pen and never slam the door and tell your child they're never welcome back in your home again. Instead, let them know in love that you'll leave the light on for them whenever they are ready to admit their mistake and return to you. Receive them when they do. True fellowship can never be restored until that prodigal child has repented, has turned away from their bad behaviors and decisions, has come to awareness of the hurt they have caused and is willing to make amends. Prodigal parents, prodigals, hang in there. Don't ever give up on your son or daughter. This is still a revolutionary and radical portrayal of God, isn't it? Right now, even in the 21st century, do you sense that God may be far away from you for some unknown reason or known reasons? Did you know that God was looking for you and for me? Jesus gave us this life-giving message today in this beautiful parable. With tender words of compassion, he is saying to you and to me, when you start home, I'll meet you there halfway. I'll treat you as if you never left. Such is the wonderful love, mercy, grace, and compassion and forgiveness of our parent God. Amen. We have been granted more than our share of the world's wealth. Often we have forgotten the source of our bounty. We grasp and spend as if all were ours to indulge our desires. This is the time to re-examine our management of what is really God's property entrusted to us for a little while. Ushers, please come forward.
please rise? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. Praise God above ye heavenly host. Creator Christ and Holy Ghost. Amen. Please join me in the unison prayer of dedication. Thank you, God, for proclaiming our worth when we do not value ourselves. Thank you for welcoming us to a celebration of life with so many precious gifts. Thank you now for the privilege of sharing so others may be led to your joyous embrace. Help us to be generous in gratitude for your lavish provisions of all our needs. Amen. Amen. to invite you uh, to a time of fellowship following our benediction and the close of the service today. We'll and uh, I'll remind you of the plaque from the, I was going to say world champion dartball team. But <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, that's grandioseness at its worst right there. <laughs> but it is something to, to behold, and I hope some of the team members uh, will hang around that plaque and share a little bit about the highlights of that day. It was a lot of fun. Thank you to the choir. It's so good to have you guys, gals and guys, back in force. Thank you. And I want the choir to do this. Extend your hands to the congregation. We would love to have you join us. <laughs> yeah, it's a fun-loving group. The practices are not that long. And Margaret does such a beautiful job in keeping things moving along. You will not waste a minute, and you will feel uplifted by being part of that, that uh, organization. So we hope you'll join us. Uh, let's join in our benediction. I will begin. Stay near to God during the week that lies ahead. Be faithful in your times of prayer. God is our hiding place and present help. We will speak to God and champion the causes of God this week. We have been reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. 
God's love and compassion have been promised us always. We will be glad and rejoice in God's goodness. We will share the joy of God's love with all people.